allow us to introduce the interim executive director of Old South Meeting House, Marty Wall. Great privilege of being the interim executive director here. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that was started back in the 1870s uh, to buy and preserve this magnificent 1729 building, which was slated for demolition back in that era. And generations, yes, exactly. Generations of Bostonians since have come together to remember what's happened here, including 245 years ago today. But we remember here not only the past, but we've learned the lessons from our nation's founding as we work hard in the years since to make sure that we protect the freedoms that were won here in Boston. And so we learned those lessons to make sure that when our government uh, tries to scale back our free speech rights or our civil liberties, here's from us, we the people. We here at Old South Meeting House believe it's incumbent upon us to protect the liberty that was won here. And that's what we as an organization have been doing for the last 141 years. So thank you for joining us. We also have a tremendous number of school programs for children. Some of you may have come here on a field trip as a kid. Uh, because we believe that it is the next generation of kids who we can train, who will then learn that it is up to them as adults to make sure that we protect the liberties that were won here. And so we love inspiring children all year long to be in here in the meeting house and having debates like the one we're going to have here tonight. But we not only look to the past, we have an active program here, we're a museum, but this space is filled with people, we have regular evening programs, we have special programs for our members. So after you leave here tonight, come back and visit us. There's always something happening here at the meeting house. And that's really as it should be. We're not just a museum, and I think our founders would be very proud to see all of the activity that continues to happen here. So tonight, we look back, but at Old South Meeting House, we also always look to the future as we strive to create a more perfect union. So on behalf of Old South Meeting House, welcome to December 16, 1773. My name is George Robert Twelves Hughes. Perhaps you've heard of me. I've been a shoemaker most of my life, a tradesman of the humble class. But as an old man, I am paraded around in my colonial clothing as the last surviving participant in the Boston Tea Party. How strange it is for me to think of what I've seen here in Boston, how I witnessed a nation born of protest. I was no student of history or government myself. My entire education consisted of only a, a moderate knowledge of reading and writing. But, and I, I associated, had no associations, I participated in no government. But in the years before our War of Independence, I became a staunch liberty boy. upon the unwarrantable hardships perpetrated on the citizens of Boston by the tyranny of Great Britain. And my mind was excited with an inextinguishable desire to aid in chastising the king. I sat in this very hall after the bloody massacre on King Street in March of 1770 and again for our meetings of the body of the people in 1773, when we decided the fate of that team. I came into this hall a tradesman, a shoemaker. I left a true citizen! I ask you tonight to indulge me and join with me in a journey back in time to 1773. Together, you and I will, do, will take part in one of the most important events in American history. Just as I did once before, we will debate the issues of the tax on tea and those three ships 
of tea floating in the harbor. And then, my friends, then we may take a walk to the harbor, perhaps. Yes. Now, I would like you to imagine what it was like here on the evening of December 16th, 1773. You have all gathered here in Old South Meeting House, the largest building in the town, and with over 5,000 other colonists, it is the largest political meeting ever held in the town of Boston. We have gathered here for over two weeks to try to decide what to do about the three shiploads of tea that lie anchored in the harbor. must pay a tax upon it. <laughs> Our early meetings, however, have resolved that the tea must never be landed, for we will not pay that tax! <laughs> the royal authorities, however, affirm that the tea must be unloaded by midnight tonight, and that the tax must be paid. <laughs> attempts to return this tea to England has failed. Tonight, we will make one final attempt to find a legal method of refusing this tea. Now, tonight, we meet as the body of the people, which means even the lower ranks, journeymen and tradesmen like me, may participate in the debate. Even you all may participate. You can lend your voice. In your programs, you will find a card. If that card is blue, you will be arguing tonight as a loyalist. If, however, that card is yellow, you will be arguing tonight as a patriot. at the meeting, simply step up to one of these devices here and in the balcony and wait for the moderator to call your turn. If you do not get a chance to speak, you can still show your support for your fellow loyalist or patriot. But I ask you to do so as I and my fellow colonists once did. To show your support, you should say and yell and shout, Huzzah! <laughs> Let's warm it up and give it on my count. One, two, three! <laughs> that was good. That was good. But remember, King George and his parliament are 3,000 miles away. So let's try that one more time, shall we? One, two, three! <laughs> for those speakers that, from, with whom you disagree. And to do that, you shout, FIVE! So let's try that. One, two, three, FIVE! We'll be hearing a bit of that tonight, too. Now, I have heard that the Sons of Liberty are in the hall. <laughs> that they may put into action if it is required. Now, I ask you to follow the instructions of your meeting moderator. He will alert you by raising this gavel when our meeting is adjourned and our procession may begin. So, let us go back in time. Oh, there I am, right there. A much younger man, indeed. But one marked by the habits of industry, integrity, temperance, and economy. I also see that our evening's moderator has arrived. So let us join the meeting. I turn the pulpit over to Mr. Samuel Savage of Weston. Mr. Revere, thank you very much for the notes from last meeting.
First, I wish to, to thank the clerk for the most recent minutes of our last meeting. I call this meeting to order. We have met here in the Old South Meeting House since November 29th to decide the fate of the cargo of tea. At those meetings, this body has resolved, number one, that the duty imposed by Parliament upon tea landed in America is a tax upon Americans without their consent. <laughs> that a virtuous and steady opposition to the ministerial plan of governing America is absolutely necessary to preserve even the shadow of liberty. And it is a duty which every free man in America owes to his country, to himself, and to his posterity. <laughs> that the resolution by the East India Company to send out their teas to America subject to the payment of duties on its being landed here is a violent attack upon the liberties of America and that it is the duty of every American to oppose this attempt. We have made every effort to prevent the landing of the tea and paying of the duty. Ah, I see Mr. Francis Roach. Master of the Dartmouth, you were asked earlier to go to customs and request a clearance for your vessel, the Dartmouth, to leave Boston Harbor without unloading its cargo of tea. Ten men, including Mr. Samuel Adams, accompanied you as witnesses. Please tell this body what has transpired, sir. Yes, Mr. Savage. Uh, a customs collector by the name of Richard Harrison conferred with his superior, whose opinion it was that the Dartmouth could not be cleared to leave Boston Harbor until the duties had been paid upon the articles of war. Then, gentlemen, upon our insistence, Mr. Roach applied to the naval officer in charge of St. Passage, Master Castle. He, too, said that the ship could not be released until Mr. Roach produced a release. Chair, that's Mr. Paul Revere, sir. I move that Mr. Roach protest against the Customs House and procure a pass of the governor, and that he, on this day, set sail with his vessel to London. Mr. Roach. I cannot. It is quite simply impractical, impossible even. No, I will not. I can. You promised to take your ship Dartmouth out of the harbor within 20 days of its arrival. Tomorrow is the 20th day. Will you give the order for your ship to set sail this day, sir? No. No, I cannot. the resolution set forth in Philadelphia regarding this oppressive act, all towns in the province must appoint a committee of inspection, oh. so this tea is never landed. Yeah. 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 Mr. Isaac Winslow Clark, set yourself before. I, Uncle, and I encourage merchants to stand firm and pursue their right to sell this tea. The tax is poultry actually benefits Kronos. Is that worth the bloodshed the so-called Sons of Liberty seek to call upon us? My cousin imports English tea in a legal manner. 
Unlike the smuggler of Beacon Hill, who brings his Dutch team. in this matter if we attack one another. Oh, man. Why don't we make Mr. Roach's return? Are there others who wish to speak? Mr. Copley. Thank you, sir. I am but an artist. I am not a politician. But like many of you in this town, I too have been drawn into this matter. Just one month ago, my father-in-law, Richard Clark, and the other tea consignees were very desirous to see peace return to this town. But it was utterly beyond their control to send the tea back to England. But they agreed to store the tea until further orders were given. They would even allow the tea to be inspected as to assure your committees that no tea was stolen or sneaked away and sold. But this body refused that concession. And as such, the tea consignees have no other opinion as they were not instrumental in introducing the tea to the town, they would allow the people to continue in the progress of the same. Mr. Mayor, you are out of order, sir. Please wait to be recognized by the moderator. Selectman John May, you now have the floor. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As I was saying, the consignees desire that the blame be placed on the people of Boston alone. Yeah, yeah. They are pawns of the governor and under his immediate influence. Yeah! Let us not forget that two of the seven consignees here in Boston are Governor Hutchinson's sons. Others, his friends and in-laws. Governor Hutchinson himself has set this devilish plan in motion to lay fault on us all. Yeah! They must be excused from sending it back to England. Yeah. Chairman, that's Mr. William Waldo, sir. All this talk is though the consignees were but passive instruments to the king's will. It is not so long ago, Mr. Clark and I spoke out in one voice against these unjust taxes. But just last month, he refused outright to meet with me and others of the Sons of Liberty to discuss these matters in a civil fashion. Civil. In this blunt refusal, gentlemen, the consignees have shown themselves to be just as guilty of wrongdoing as Parliament itself! Sir, you speak as though you and your ruffian compatriots were the gentlemen in this debate. I? Mr. Clark and the other consignees are only protecting themselves and their families from the likes of you, sir. Refusing to show their face at even a public meeting such as this. Was it not you, sir, who threatened my good friend, Mr. Clark, following his wise refusal to meet with an unnamed mob? What you call the Liberty Tree? Right. Was it not you, Mr. Molino, who not so long ago led an unnamed mob to ransack the home of our Lieutenant Governor? No. Why, I should sure not call you sir, but instead your more fitting nickname known throughout the town, William the Name.
defend the fortunes of America. As the chair recognizes Selectman John May, sir. What good would representation in Parliament do us? Even if we were allowed to send 13 representatives to that unjust body, one for each colony, or two or three for each colony, what would it matter? We would be outvoted. Then we will have legitimized Parliament's right to impose upon us any tax that they wish. Parliament, in my opinion, representation in Parliament is a straw man, I say. We claim the right to raise our own taxes, and we will not surrender that right to the corrupt, placement and venal politicians of Parliament. Yeah. Yeah. Distressed that there are those among us who would seek to delude us about this wholesome and legal beverage. Oh, if there is a poison about it, it is that which flows from the pens and the lips of those who would seek to incite the mob to attack honest merchants and their innocent customers. Is a three pence per pound tax really worth the destruction of trade in this town? I recognize Mr. Samuel Allen, sir. Governors have the right to seek out and take what they please! Yeah. Rather than be content with the station afforded to them, that of honorable servants of society, they instead become absent masters, despots, and tyrants! has the right to dictate what wages he will give in his private affairs. So too has the community the right to dictate what of its substance it will give in the administration of public affairs. Order. Chair recognizes Mr. Archibald Wilson. Sir, thank you. Well, I suppose Mr. Adams would prefer we drink his rough. I fear any excesses of Parliament far less than the petty tyrants and despots in this town who hide behind their noble sentiments and seek to destroy those who would oppose them. I strive to serve the needs of my customers of all political persuasions. Dissent is the lifeblood of the body politic. But when it interferes with my right to carry on my business, then it defames the principles it purports to uphold. Are there any others who wish to have their voices heard? Please let them come forth and offer up their sentiments. We have two places in the front. We have two in the balcony. Uh, The chair will recognize the speaker to my left in the balcony, young lady in the green jacket. My name is Thomas Bradley. I think King George has been very good to us, but I worry about what will happen if the Patriots continue to defy him. Coolidge. The loyalists say the Patriots are breaking the laws. 
This is true, but I think that when fair laws are unfair, it's our duty to rebel. My name is Thomas Bradley. We must continue to resist Parliament's law. The T Act is an abomination. from coming into any town. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Mr. Roach, you've returned from requesting a pass from Governor Hutchinson 
to return to England without unloading the cargo of tea. Please tell this meeting what has happened. His Excellency is willing to grant anything consistent with the laws and his duty to the king. But says that he cannot give a pass to a vessel that has not been properly qualified by the Gentlemen, Francis Roach must suffer no harm to his self or to his property. He has shown us this evening that he is an honorable man who has done everything in our in his power to assist us. <laughs> Mr. Roach, under the present circumstances, will you order the Dartmouth back to London? Cargo of tea. Oh, I apprehend that would be my route. <laughs> if you will not order your vessel and its cargo back to London, will you attempt to land the tea? I have no business with it, sir. If properly called upon to do so, then I would seek compliance with the regulations of the customs. <laughs>
people having manifested exemplary patience and caution have done everything in their power to prevent it from the ending of the tea and the pain and the duty thereon. We have endeavored in every way to return it to its owners unharmed, but we have been obstructed by the consignees and their coadjutors. Therefore, there can be nothing more done this night. This meeting is dissolved! Thank you for coming out in this wonderful weather. I'm enjoying it. 
My name is George Robert Quills Hughes. I see we've all made it to the water's edge where our story of December 16, 1773 continues. Nearly three weeks ago, the first ship carrying East India Company tea arrived here in Boston Harbor. The following morning, there were broadsides posted all about the town, calling for a massive meeting of the body of the people to form a united resistance to this detestable tea. <laughs> those meetings, we determined that the tea must not be unloaded, for if it is landed, we must pay an unjust tax upon it, and my friends, we will not pay that tax! We have requested of these officials time and time again that these ships, these tea ships, be sent back from whence they came. Every request has been denied. Governor Hutchinson himself, just an hour ago, refused to pass for these ships to leave. The royal authorities reaffirm that the tea must be unloaded by midnight tonight and that the tax must be paid. Well, perhaps we can help them with the unloading part. The time has come to act. We have just come from a massive meeting of the body of the people at Old South Meeting House here to Griffin's Wharf with a great opportunity for us. I call upon every one of you, every friend to his country, every friend to posterity, make your voices heard this night! 340 chests of East India Company tea were contained on three ships, the Eleanor, the Dartmouth, and the Beaver here at Griffin's Wharf. We were each ordered to break into three groups and destroy the tea on each ship. We were surrounded by active kingfisher, captain, ships of war. I immediately dressed in the costume of a mohawk, painted my face with lamp black and soot, and joined hundreds of others descending upon the sea. Mr. Burton, the Mariner, Mr. Blake, Mr. Smith, 
the end of the rope. So, we play this solo for one another. These intolerable 
acts lay more kindling on the fire of revolution. This dispute between England and her colonies is no longer about taxes, it has evolved. Something has changed in the hearts and the minds of the people. Now, 12 North American colonies will unite under one continental congress. And in the countryside, men will make themselves ready to lay down their lives for a cause that they be worthy of such great sacrifice. Only 16 months after the tea was destroyed in Boston Harbor, I was rowed across to the Charlestown shore as two lanterns appeared in the steeple of Old North Church. From there, I rode to the countryside, sounding the alarm as British regiments marched to Lexington and Concord, where the shot for round the world was fired! The Boston Tea Party was the single most important event leading to the American Revolution, and I, George Robert Wells Hughes, was there! Yeah.